you know, I want you to think about this for a minute. The Lord, the Lord is in the house. Really, 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 we say that, but think about it. The presence, the, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. The Spirit of God is moving in a, in a facility among people. But you know what? I brought him with me. I didn't come here to get him. I brought him with me. It is so good to see you on a Wednesday night. Once again, so many of you, the building is full. And that, that means, you know what that means? That means people are hungry. And I'm, I will tell you that I'm, uh, most of my trips to Israel, as you know, were canceled. We were going to Israel for about a month almost, and most of those are canceled. And we don't know why. I'm like, Pastor, we're taking this as it goes. You're just going to have to stay on social media, contact people to see what, what God said. We don't know. We're, uh, you know, Jensen, I almost feel like we're two young preachers again. You, you, really, you, you remember when we'd go somewhere and say, God, I don't know what you're doing. I, I'll do whatever. And that's how I feel. And I, I love this man. I can't even tell you how much. Him and his wife and family and knew him, knew him right when they got married. And I'm telling you what, I, I've got to, you, you can be seated. I've got to shut up because I got to preach. If you're not careful, the older you get, you reminisce a lot. You, you, you'll, you'll just waste time. <laughs> We're not going to do that tonight. Charlie, who's my office manager, is here. And Hold him up, Charlie, just so they'll know. In the back, there's, now you got to, you face, oh, he's going to do that way. Uh, the Fed coin, people talk about crypto coming. That'll talk about five things that has to happen before they'll do it. Next, real quick, Charlie, next, next, next. Um, that was one of my favorites. Angelic warfare during prophetic seasons. God will release more angels when prophecies are fulfilled than any other time throughout the Bible. And it's maybe one other thing there, just real quick, just. Oh, end time parables revealed, uh, end time secrets revealed in the parables. He'll be in the back, back here. That helps our ministry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce this by saying this, that <clears throat> when people ask you, what type of meeting is this? The, the word keeps coming to me, repentance and restoration. It's, it's just like this whole theme since Sunday has just been not only prophetic, and if the Lord's will, we'll, we'll throw some prophetic things out there, possibly one of the heaviest ones on Sunday night. I don't want to announce it yet. We're going to pray about it. But I want to tell you that um, the Lord has dealt with me in my own life and also recently on the number of people that are wounded by the church and people that will not go to church because they were wounded by a Christian. Christians have a higher expectation. Whether we like that or not, they expect us to be different than them. And when we're not, there's a lot of disappointments that come. In Psalms chapter 23, verse 3, you know the 23rd Psalm, we're not going to quote all of it, but David was going through a tough time being chased by Saul in the wilderness. And he said this word, God, he restoreth my soul. For the next few moments, I want to give you a word that the Lord gave me called restoring your wounded soul. Restoring your wounded soul. Psalms 23, the background is that King Saul, who was the father-in-law of, I'm sorry, yes, King Saul, who was the father-in-law of David, is chasing David in the wilderness, attempting to assassinate him. There were so many numerous attempts, I counted 21 attempts, either through people or through Saul himself, to try to kill David. David, however, was a shepherd. He was familiar with the Judean wilderness. He knew the caves, he knew the places to hide. He makes a statement in Psalms 23 and verse 4, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. He said that because he was on a hit list. He was on a terrorist hit list, if you please. A man named Saul wanted him dead and did everything he could. So he's walking continually through the valley of the shadow of death. But he said, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, you are with me. Then in Psalms 23 and verse 5, he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. What that meant was, I am being provided for in this dry place, surrounded by people who want me dead. Let me just tell you something. The devil nor people can do anything with you when God is for you, who can be against you. And David found that out for sure. Now, one of the fascinating things about the Psalms is the metaphors that David uses, and I really feel strongly in my spirit to share a couple of these with you. Psalms chapter 42 and verse 1, David says this, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so my soul panteth after thee, O God. I was at a place called En Gedi in Israel where possibly this was written. 
There's a lot of hearts there, H-A-R-T. These are deer. We would call them deer over here. Gazelle is a better translation. And I watch these gazelles as they literally are so fast and they're so light on their feet, they jump from rock to rock and from hill to hill. And I said, what did David mean is the heart pants after the water brook? And I can imagine in my mind, he's in the Judean wilderness and he watches a heart, maybe even being chased by a hunter on a horse. And it's running at full speed. Its tongue is hanging out. And all it wants is a drink of water from the springs of En Gedi. But he can't get it because if he stops, he's going to be killed. So he simply keeps on running. And he saw that, that, gazelle panting for breath. And he says, oh God, just like that heart is panting for water. My soul is thirsty for you. Have you ever really been thirsty for the presence of almighty God? I don't believe you'd be here if you weren't. Another metaphor that I love he used is Psalms chapter 91 and verse one, where he says, that he will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, this is perhaps one of the most unique passages because he talks about the sh David talks about the shadow of the Almighty in the following verses. And you don't have to bring these up, gentlemen. These are references. Psalm 17, 8, 36, 7, 57, 1, 63, 7, and 91 and 1. And it always puzzled me because how can God have a shadow? In him is light and there is no shadow of turning. That's what the New Testament says. And then I, th I, th I think, well, maybe the shadow of his wings. I, I abide under the shadow of his wings. Well, is God a bird? No, I read nowhere in the Bible that God has wings. He's not an angel. Angels do have wings, but I don't read where God has wings. And so one day I was studying and I actually went to Jerusalem to a head rabbi. And I said, am I correct in preaching this? He said, 100%. You must remember that in the time of David, there was the Ark of the Covenant, that David brought the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem and built a tent called the Tabernacle of David. There's only one chapter in the Bible about it. And he put it on that beautiful white limestone rock. Now, here's what would happen during the time when there was no rain and the weather was good and the sun was out, David could remove the top covering of that tent. And here's what took place. The sunlight would cast a light on that golden Ark of the Covenant. And it was like a sundial. Have you ever seen the old sundials, how the dial sits up and the shadow moves with the dial? And David knew, I cannot touch that Ark. If I touch that Ark, I'm not a Levite. I'll drop dead. I can't pick it up. But here's what I can do. When the sun from heaven is shining on the wings of those two cherub and the wings of those two cherub are casting a shadow on that white rock. I can get on down in the shadow of the almighty because the Bible said that God dwelt between the wings of the cherub. So in other words, I can't touch the ark. I can't lift it. But what I can do, all I need is the shadow of his wings. And he said, when I'm in the shadow of his wings, no plague will come near me. No disease can touch me and no enemy can and take me out. And what the shadow of his wings represents to us is the presence of the Holy Spirit that abides on the inside of our tent, our earthly tabernacle. And so if we are flowing in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is flowing within us, we have a Psalms 91 protection that we are abiding in the shadow of the almighty God. Come on, somebody, did you get what I just said? Hallelujah. Absolutely fantastic imagery. But one of the things that really stood out to me is the word where David talks about the soul. In fact, in the Psalms, he mentions the soul so many times. The soul, the word soul is mentioned 419 times in scripture. And I want to try to explain this to you. I'm going to break this down. This is not in my notes, but I want to break this down. First Thessalonians 5.23. Every person in this room is a body a soul and the spirit. Now look at your neighbor and say, hello, body. <laughs> because what did you just look at? You looked at their body. Now you cannot see their soul, but you can discern their soul. You did not see their spirit, but you can discern their heart or their spirit. So here's how I break this down. I'm going to keep this brief. The body is the physical flesh. The soul is the, the emotions and the will that's connected to your feelings and your emotions. So the soul is linked to feeling and emotion. Now, don't forget that. That's real significant in a minute. Your spirit, if it jumped out of your body, would look just like you. Now, someone asked me one time that was rather weighty. They said, am I going to be this big when my spirit leaves my body? 
I said, I don't know, but if you eat in heaven like you did on earth, we'll see. <laughs> it was a friend. It was a friend, by the way. No offense, no offense, but it was a friend, by the way. But your spirit, you remember when Lazarus died in Luke chapter 19, and it says the angels carried his, carried his soul or spirit to Abraham's bosom. So when you die, angels release the spirit and soul out of the body. In fact, the soul and spirit are so connected together that the Bible says only the word of God can separate the soul from the spirit. So instead of talking about the spirit man, the spirit is the eternal part of you. The spirit looks like you. The spirit when you die never ages. It looks younger. Aren't you all glad when we get to heaven that, wait a minute, that everybody who has ever seen anybody in heaven says they're 25 to 30 years of age. Come on, who's looking forward to getting there? Come on, help me. Where's my old crowd in the house tonight? Is anybody looking forward to looking good again? I asked my wife one day, I said, they say you're going to be 25 or 30 years of age in heaven. Honey, you, you've been with me 40 some years. How old do you want me to look in heaven? I promise you, we, these women know how to swoon you. And my wife looks at me and she says, it don't really matter to me because you've looked good all your life. Watch out. There's going to be a short sermon tonight. Look out here. <laughs> Better be careful here. Now, so what I want to tell you is about the soul. Now, here's what I want to say again. The soul, body, soul, and spirit. Your soul is called nephesh, nephesh in Hebrew. And here's what the Bible says. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Life, nephesh. The nephesh of a human body is in the blood. Take the blood out of your body and the life of your body leaves. You are D-E-A-D -E dead. As the spirit without the body is dead, James said so, a faith without works is dead. So your soul and spirit are connected to the point that they both exit your body when you pass away. However, I want to ask you a question. The Bible says this, the spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. Has anyone ever noticed that when you get very frightened, where do you feel it first? In your belly. If a car pulls out of you, where do you feel it first? Okay, do you know why? Because there's a gut nerve that runs from your belly into your brain. It connects. And I don't have time to get into all this because we get sidetracked. So here's what I want to say to you. Why is the soul important? Because the soul carries every type of emotion known to mankind. The emotional part of you that part that gets angry, that part that gets happy, that part that gets sad affects your spirit, but the actual feeling of it is coming through what the Bible calls the soul. Now, I want to give you a bunch of verses. Now, guys, again, we're going to go through these so fast that we don't want to put them on the screen, but we just want to give you the reference, okay? And if you're writing these down, you better be able to write in tongues and interpret, okay? Because it's going to be so fast that I promise you I'll be at number three while you're still at number one. But all of these are found in the Bible. Listen to what David, all, this is all the Psalms. Listen to what he says about the soul. He had this great revelation about the soul. Psalm 6 verse 3, the soul can be vexed. Psalm 7 verse 2, the soul can be torn like a lion has, a lion has attacked it. Psalm 7 verse 5, the soul... Uh, lost some place. Give me a second here. 7 verse 5, the soul can be persecuted by enemies. Psalms 13, 2, the soul can feel sorrow deep within the heart. Psalms 42 uh, verse 5, the soul can be cast down or pressed down. I'm, I may mention something about that. Very fascinating in a moment. Psalms 55, 18, the soul can have battles that are set against it. Psalm 63 and verse 9, people can seek a person's soul to destroy it. Psalms 88 verse 3, the soul can be full of troubles. Psalms 107 verse 5, the soul can faint within the body. If someone gets word that their loved one was killed in an accident, you feel a fainting spirit. You feel weak. Your legs give out. You have to hold somebody up. What happened? The soul fainted, became weak within the body. Psalms 143 verse 6, the soul can become spiritually thirsty. So for those of you that just feel this pulling desire to be here, you're changing your schedule. You're going to keep changing your schedule because you want to be. You know, what, you know what that's a sign of? Your soul is thirsty for God's presence and to hear what God has to say to you. That's, that's, that's hunger and thirst. It comes from the soul. Now it affects the spirit, that eternal part of you, but it comes from the soul. Psalms 143 and verse 12 says, the soul can be afflicted. Now listen to what I'm going to say very carefully. We have heard it preached all of our life, and it's 100% true 
that the battle begins in the mind. But the battle that begins in the mind will always impact the soul or the very life force that is on the inside of you. The soul and spirit, and this is very significant, and I want to emphasize this again. The soul and the spirit are what carries your feelings and your emotions. So the Bible talks about an offended brother is harder to win than a city with gates. Why is that? Because when you are hurt to the point that you emotionally feel it, that's when you have a real wound. Enemies that talk bad about you that you don't know do not affect your soul because you are not emotionally connect, connected with them. It is your husband. It is your wife. It is your children that cuss you out when you invite them to church. It's those workers you've worked with for years that betray you and say things about you. It's that, come on women, it's that girlfriend you had that told your secret. I got I got to find out what y'all been dealing with because I can't get too much out of you right now. We're going to find out where your soul problem is. I'm not, I, tomorrow's message, let me just say this. God gave me a word. I've been wanting to preach it since I've been here, but tomorrow's message is very significant. And I was going to make a statement, but the Holy Spirit checked me. He said, you save that statement for tomorrow night because everybody's going to need it. Okay, so I'm going to save that for tomorrow night. So let's stay here. Now, here's what the Bible says. David says this. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted? Now, what does disquieted mean? It means a loud sound that has come to distract you. In other words, why are you cast down and why are you being distracted by all the sounds that are going on around you? I did a study on cast down. I was actually in Bethlehem looking at a bunch of sheep when a man explained to me what the word from the Bible cast down means. It's very interesting. Here's what would happen. It's a metaphor about sheep. Sheep can become very heavy with their wool, and when they do, they can actually roll over on the side and end up on their back with their four legs up in the air. And their feet are up in the air, and they're flaying, and they're trying to roll over, and they can't. And it's just like when you have something that panics you in a panic attack, and your heart starts beating fast. Well, next thing you know, their heart starts beating fast. They're panicking. They start breathing, breathing real heavy. Now, the only thing that can help that sheep, and this is a fact, is the shepherd turning it over and holding it and rubbing its belly because what happens is the, the gases begin to build, build up in the inner part of the sheep. If it continues to lay on its back, and this is being called cast down, by the way, if it continues to lay on its back and the gases begin to build, here's what happens. It eventually cuts off the breathing of the sheep and the sheep slowly dies. When a sheep is cast down, this is important, when it's lying on its back, it cannot flee from an enemy, nor can it go into the hands of the shepherd if the shepherd's not near. And it becomes an easy prey for the predators, which in that day were the bears and the lions. Now, what this means is, do you remember when Jesus said to Peter in Luke 22, Satan has desired you that he may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. In other words, Peter was going to fall so low that he was going to realize he had failed God and he was going to go out, which he did, and weep bitterly and be so condemned feeling over it that he would be so cast down that he would feel like his faith was useless and he lost his faith. So when the cast down spirit comes to you, it's when you quit walking, you roll over, you lay down, you get depressed, you want to quit, you want to give up. That would be the metaphor he would use to describe anybody in this building, for example, that feels like that they have, they have been cast down and they're in a position of where they just don't feel like living, but they want to live, but they can't live because they're stuck in a rut, they're stuck in an area, they're stuck in a situation. Now he says this, to be cast down, let me say something, for you to be cast down means that something has knocked you completely off of your feet. Would a sudden job loss do that? Yes. Would an unexpected death of a family member do that? Yes. Would a sudden storm that destroys everything you own do that? Yes. Would uh, an unexpected divorce of a companion do that? Yes. Would, a, would the doctor announcing to you that you have a terminal disease do that? Absolutely yes. There are signs 
And this is a, this, listen, this is for some people here. This is just not a good teaching lesson. There are many of you, the Lord told me, that feel like you are in a cast down situation. Somebody here said today, you said this, I feel like I'm stuck in a rut. You said, I feel like I'm stuck in life. I feel like my life is going nowhere. You have made these statements recently to people, and that is being cast down. No forward movement, not going back on God, no forward movement, rolling over and just saying, I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like reading my Bible. I don't feel like praying. That is when you know that you have been cast down. So let me just say this to you that it takes a shepherd, which would be the preaching of the word, the anointing of the spirit, you coming to God to get you back on your feet. That's why in this meeting, we have altar calls. We could have worship and preach and dismiss, and we said, oh, that's happy, wasn't that good? But I want to tell you, we have the altar call because your meeting with God is what will get you back on your feet where you need to be. That's why you have an altar call at Free Chapel Revival. David also said this, and this is for somebody here again. Yea, my own, and I, let me give you the verse, guys. It's Psalms 41 and verse 9. I'd like for you to see this one. And most of these are going to be from the King James translation. My own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Now that is David saying this. Somebody that ate at my table and he even talks about we even took sweet fellowship in the house of God. They went to the tabernacle together. They worshiped together, has suddenly betrayed him. Now, I don't know if you understand Matthew 24, what it says that in the last days, many would be offended and hate one another and betray one another. And the love of many would wax cold. A betrayal from a not so close friend is not too painful. A betrayal from a close friend is horrible. A betrayal from a family member is hell. Thank you all three of you to been there. Who, who's been there? Talk to me, somebody. So David had someone he knew. Now, here's what happened. Let me get the setting. He had sinned with Bathsheba, and everybody knew it, and everybody was talking about it. And whoever this was, some say it was Bathsheba's uh, grandfather, who was a board member, so to speak, with David. And I, I, I'm sorry I didn't write his name down. I should have done that. But that he loved David, but when he found out what he did with Bathsheba and he killed Uriah, he was ready to, he was ready to say, get rid of the guy, get him off the throne, or take him out and hang him. And David said, this man whom I love has lifted up his heel. Now, let me explain lifting up the heel, because this is a, um, a Hebrew phrase that would have been known in the time of King David, and it is this. When a man had a horse uh, that he loved very dearly, and it was a horse that he rode, it was his personal horse, he rode it with the saddle, and he is out feeding his horse. He is literally taking the grain and feeding the horse, and he gets behind the horse. The horse kicks it, and it actually kicks the man in the head. And things like this have happened before. So it was the heel, so to speak, the hoof, but the heel of the horse that kicks the man in the head who is feeding it. This is what, this is what makes this idea of what David said, a friend has lifted up his heel so bad because he's saying, I fed him, we ate together, we went to church together, and all of a sudden, here this guy yeah, David says, yeah, I did wrong, but there's a right way and a wrong way to handle it. I've repented. I've cried. I'm in misery. But he says, what he wants to do is just keep kicking me while I'm down and kick me again while I'm down and tell people what he thinks while I'm down. I don't know if you've ever had that happen where somebody has lifted up their heel against you. Who in the house has ever had somebody familiar to you lift up their heel against you? Raise your hand. I want to see how many hands go up in the balcony as well. And this is, a, again, a miserable feeling. So David, now look at what he's going through. I'm giving you these sheep and shepherd metaphor, metaphors to help you understand what he went through. But I want you to listen to the next verse because this is where we're going to go just for the next few minutes. And it's this, that in the book of Zechariah 13, verse 6, there is a prophecy that when you read this, you know it's a messianic prophecy. It is not about somebody from Zechariah's day. It is a verse, absolutely, that deals with 
When Jesus, and actually the setting is this. If you go to Zechariah 13 and 14, here's the setting. I always want to give you the setting of a very unusual verse. The prophet is telling the Israelites that the Lord's feet would stand on the Mount of Olives and the mountain is going to cleave in two parts, one part to the east and one part to the west. And that's when the Lord returns to rule on earth. Revelation 19 and Zechariah 14 are put together there. This is what's happening. So he comes back to the Mount of Olives and the mountain splits according to Zechariah. Now, when that happens, you will see what the verse says because it's talking about wounds in the hand. Wounds in the hand. Now, we know that Jesus carries the wounds of his crucifixion. How do we know that? Because after he was resurrected, he appeared to Thomas and he said, touch me, touch me. The spirit doesn't have flesh and bone, but touch me. And he looked and he saw the, the wounds in his hand. And by the way, they wouldn't have been in the palm. They would have been here, right there. But that's a part of the hand. Uh, that's considered the part of the hand. And he also had wounds in the feet. And he said, now, he pulls up his robe and said, put your hand in here. And I always said that when Thomas the doubter put his hand in the cut where the spear had cut the side of Jesus, and he, he says he thrust his hand in, he touched the heart of God. And he screamed, my Lord and my God, when he felt something when he did that. But watch the verse. Watch the prophecy. Now, that's the setting. They will say to him in that day, where did you get these wounds? And he will say, when I was wounded in the house of my friend. He was wounded among his own people. He came to his own and his own rejected him. Now, I'm going to tell you the most painful wound you will ever go through. Death is temporary. Over time, with the help of God, you always have the memory of who you love, but you can get over the pain of death. It, sometimes it takes years, but you can get over that. A divorce is horrible. You watch your children cry at night. Where's mommy? Where's daddy? It's a hard thing, but people have recovered and moved on with their life. But I'm going to tell you where more people, if they're not careful, will lose out with the Lord. It's called sacred wounds. When you're wounded in the house of God. When you're wounded by Christians who talk in tongues one minute and sit at a restaurant table and cut you down like a dog the next minute. I would never do this, but I say this in a, uh, just in a symbolic sense. But if I took my shirt off, which you don't want, trust me. <laughs> if I took my shirt off and showed you my back, there would be knife prints where I've been stabbed over the years by people in the house of my friends. They didn't like something I said. They didn't like something I did. They were offended at me. Maybe they were offended at what I preached. I was a heretic because I believe... I believed in the coming of the Lord. I'm suddenly a heretic. Huh. I'm going to say this to you. Everybody here has a story. And everybody here, can I tell you something? Your kids haven't heard all your testimony. Can I'm going to tell some of you something. And it might be good they never hear all your testimony. <laughs> you know, when you, when, you, when, you, when you tell those kids, don't you be doing that. You're saying to yourself, well, I did it. God, I hope they never know I did it. Jesus, don't let them ever find out, right? Who, who am I talking to? Raise a, raise a Baptist hand up. Come on, little Baptist hand right there. You don't have to go, don't do the Pentecostal thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah you're talking to me now, preacher. <laughs> right? They've not heard all your testimony because some of your testimony is between you and God and you hide the story because you don't want everybody to know your junk. You know why I don't talk about other people's junk? Because I don't want everybody talking about my junk. Somebody told me, just a smart aleck one time. Well, Perry Stone, I bet there's some skeletons in your closet. Huh? Some skeletons in your closet. I said, yeah. And if you open that door, you're going to find out there's blood on those bones. <laughs> that the blood of Jesus uh, has cleansed from anything and everything that ever said. Well, I... <laughs> Woo! Huh? <laughs> But the hardest wounds, and I, and I, and I want to get serious because this is for somebody here. 
is an offense that happened in a church and maybe you you left and maybe in the process of leaving, you were talked about or maybe you did something and it was wrong and it was talked about. But what I want to talk to you about is the remedy for a wound. There is a remedy for every wound that everybody in this building is carrying. This is very important because you need to hear this. There's something, that's, there's, some, there's a phrase, it's a theological phrase, but it's also a phrase which is used all through the Old Testament, and it says atonement. It's used 80 times in the Old Testament. It is used just very limited. Uh, redemption is used in the New Testament, but the word atonement is used. In the Old Testament, it's the word kafar, and it means to cover, to appease, to, 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 to disannul, or to forgive. The... the scapegoats on the day of atonement, one of the, the sixth celebration that Israel celebrated where they fasted all days. Oh, can I preach this for just a minute and tell you what they did on the day of atonement? Some of you have never heard this. On the day of atonement, everybody would fast and the high priest would take two goats that were completely identical. They had to be identical and they had what was called a lottery. Now don't think of the lottery with numbers. This was two boxes called lots or the word was lottery. And the high priest would stand before those two goats and he would raise his hand and pray. And then he would put his hand in one of the boxes and it would say in Hebrew for the Lord, or it would say for Azazel. Now, what does that mean? One of those goats was going to be offered on an altar for Israel's sins for the Lord. In other words, it was the Lord's goat. The other goat was going to be have hands laid on it and the sins transferred to it. And it would be, have a rope tied around its neck and a priest would that day, that day after the high priest prayed, would run that goat to the top of the Mount of Olives and there were 16 stations along the way and he would run it up to the next priest and he would grab that rope and run it to the next and the next and the next and the next. Now here's what they did. They had an 18 inch red thread. And they would tie that thread around the neck of the goat that was going to be burnt on the altar and slaughtered for the Lord. But the scapegoat, they would tie it between his two horns. Now, here's the reason why. Because the priest, when he laid sins on the goat, when he prayed, I transfer the sins of the priesthood, the Levites and the Israelites to the head of this goat. It's called the scapegoat. All right. So he escaped death, but he carried the sins. Now, they did not want that goat ever coming back into the camp, bringing what was forgiven. So they marked it with red, a red 18, it was, it was wool, a, th a big thread, 18 inches. So if you ever saw it, stay away from the goat. Stay away from the goat. And, you know, they ate goats back then, and you sure enough didn't want to kill the goat that had the sin on it and eat it. Come on. So eventually... They would take it to a place called the Mount of the Azazel. Now, Azazel was the name of a fallen angel, according to church tradition. But the Mount of the Azazel, Azazel is another name for Satan. And finally, what they did is they would take it to the top and push it off of that hill. And it would roll down the hill to its death. Now, here's the part that really gets cool. Ready? This is all in Jewish history. On the Day of Atonement, they had three red threads. One was on the neck of the goat for the Lord. One was on the horns of the goat, Azazel, the scapegoat. And they nailed the other one to the temple door. When the scape, how would they know the scapegoat was dead miles away? How would they know? Because tradition, and it's written in history, that the red thread on the temple door turned white when the scapegoat was dead. And it meant, now listen to what Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet said. Here it is. Here's the verse. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. He's talking about that thread. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It was made out of wool. It was red in color. And they knew the sins had been forgiven. When the goat was dead, God supernaturally turned the red thread white as snow. And the people could then know their sins were forgiven. Now, on the day of atonement, three threads, right? One for the Lord, one for the scapegoat, one that escaped, and one that changed colors. You ready for this? Three crosses on Golgotha. One, Jesus is dying for the Lord. One changed, was a sinner, and became white as snow. 
and the other died with the sins on him. Talk to me some. My, 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 my. Now, you're a, we're going to get to this now. You're a body, soul, and spirit, correct? But atonement is to forgive, and it means to reconcile. It means to appease to the point of you're good. You're no longer bad. You're good. God has changed something. So Jesus on the cross, and, and I've heard this for years, that the cross, and, and a lot of the good uh, preachers on TV preach this, the cross brought you your salvation through the blood. Yes. Then the Pentecostals and Charismatics add another part to the atonement. Isaiah 53, with his stripes you, are, you were healed, or you are healed. Peter said it in his writing, with his stripes you were healed. So in other words, we add healing to that. So we add a bodily atonement and not just a spiritual atonement. But stop and let me tell you the third one. Ready? And I, can I tell you, I never heard this preached, preached on growing up. And it should have been preached on. If you will go to Isaiah 53 and I start looking at that messianic prophecy, that's the one that says that he made his grave with a rich man, and it talks about with his stripes were healed. That's Isaiah 53 is a messianic prophecy. It's about, you can start at verse one, go all the way through it. It's all about the crucifixion, all about Jesus going to the tomb. It's there. But then I read this one day, Jensen. The ch Ooh, the, the chest. He was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Sorrow and grief is not physical. It is emotional. Grief is an emotion. Sorrow is an emotion. Now listen to this one. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. It jumped out at me. I said, what in the world is the chastisement of our peace? And the Lord spoke to me. What is a chastisement? I said, it's a whipping. When, when the Bible says whom God loves, he chastises. What that means is God can whip you. Listen, don't make daddy mad. Because <laughs> daddy can whip. How many, know, how many of you ever felt like you got a chastisement from God for something? Come on, somebody. Oh, the rest of you are sanctified. Glory to his name. You ain't never done nothing wrong. <laughs> most, of you, most of you may not know you were being chastised. But a chastisement's a whipping. So here's what happens. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Satan tries to chastise, beat up, whip, destroy, hinder your peace. When you don't have peace, you can't sleep at night. When you don't have peace, you'll live in frustration. When you don't have peace, you'll find yourself arguing with your companion and your kids. And you say, I, I'm sorry, honey. I don't even know what's making me that way. It's because the peace that passes all understanding has been taken from you because pressures of life, cares of life has chastised your peace. How many know what I'm saying? And you can't sleep at night and you're getting up in the middle of the night because you've lost your peace. Peace and sorrow and even says he was acquainted with grief. These are emotions, watch, connected to the soul. Not so much the spirit, the soul. Read what David said. And so what happens is these are the things that wound the spirit. And the worst wound, I'm going to say it again. I feel the anointing very heavy right now. The worst wound you will ever have is to be a church member somewhere and be faithful in a church. And a division comes or people get into confusion. And the next thing you know, you have been hurt by the church. By his stripes, we are healed as for the body. Wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities is the spirit taking care of the sin. But the soul, sorrow, grief, he was oppressed. He was afflicted. And the Bible says, and God will see the travail of his soul. When Jesus' sweat became his great drops of blood in Gethsemane, it was his soul, his emotions under pressure. Prove it. He is crying out, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. His emotions. Part of him was saying, don't do this. Part of him was, listen, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
His spirit was saying, do it, do it, do it. You can do it. You can make it. Redemption's coming. And the soul, which is also connected to the flesh and the emotion, is saying, why do you want to do this? Do you know what this is going to feel like? Do you know the pain? Can't there be another way? Is anybody listening to what I'm saying right now? But here's what you've got to understand. Listen to the verse. He, Jesus, bore our grief. He bore our sins. He carried our sorrow. And it hit me one day. And I want you to understand this. If somebody comes up to me and says, Perry, let me carry that big weight for you. That's a big package. All right. There's no use in me knowing that's a weight I can't carry. And say, oh, no, I can do it. And act like I'm, you know, uh, a, a stud. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a stud that was. You understand? Some people are an Italian stallion. I happen to be Italian. They used to nickname me that. I was kind of proud of that. I, co I compared myself to Rocky Balboa, my cousin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not really my cousin. But, but I, knew, I know I can't carry the weight. So if somebody offers to carry it with me, why should, why should I carry what I know I can't carry when my buddy who's got the muscles will pick it up and carry it up a step, and all I've got to do is get behind him? Thank you. Jesus, I, I really, if I, oh, I don't know how I can get this across from, from you. If Jesus carried our grief, if Jesus bore our sorrow, you know what that means? It's the same as the scapegoat. That goat, when that priest put his hands on that goat, all sins in the eyes of God were transferred to the goat. Those people that had sinned could be free all because of one thing a high priest did. I, it hit me one day. I said, wait a minute. Honest to goodness, if Jesus carried my peace, why, why, why is it I don't have any? What's wrong with me? Okay, if he carried my grief, why am I grieving? I know there's grieving processes. Don't get me wrong, especially you that are into psychology. I understand there's a grieving process, but I've seen people grieve for their dead loved one five years. That's not right. That's a spirit of grief. And sometimes you just have to roll it over and you've got to say to the Lord, I do not want to carry this anymore. So David says this. He restoreth my soul. The, the Hebrew there, uh, one of the, the word restoreth, one of the Hebrew words is shuv. And it's where it's the word which is found in a Hebrew word called tesh, teshuvah or teshuvah. Some of you have heard me teach on that. It's 40 days of teshuvah or 40 days of teshuvah in which you you meditate on repenting and getting your right, heart right with God and forgiving others. Now, let me just say it this way. It can be said this way in English. He turns it around. He restoreth my soul. He turns this. <laughs> he turns this that is in me. He turns it around. In Hebrew, restoreth means, and I'm quoting now, to make things as they were before the failure or the fall or before the attack. Get it. Everybody get it. Do you understand that God has the ability when he restores you to make it as though it never happened? Oh, your enemies will always try to remind you of it. They're belligerent. They're going to always remind you but I, and I do not bring up in other people's lives what God has forgot. It's a sin. The word restore means to make an end and to make a recompense or to pay back for what has happened. Joel said this. I will restore to you the years that the enemy has taken. I said years. 
The devil hits you for years. But when God gets ready to restore, your restoration ain't going to take three to five years to get you back where you need to be. God will suddenly come down on you and begin to make amends of what the enemy's done. All right. You ready for this? When God says, I will restore to you the years, I looked at the Hebrew and I thought it said shalom. It did not say shalom. It is shalom. Now, shalom is a part of the word shalom. Shalom doesn't just mean hello. You know, when, when you're in Israel, they say shalom, shabbat shalom. It means it means good morning. It means have a good day. It means peace. It means have joy. It means God bless you. So when you say the word, everybody say, shout shalom. Lord, you just spoke Hebrew in one second. What about that? But let me tell you about Joel's word. I will restore to you the years. is shalom. And that means I will make, I'll bring it back. I'll make it right. I will. Let me try to describe it. I feel like I'm not getting that, getting it across where I really want you to get. I'm trying, I'm trying to describe this to you. It is to take something which is horrible, something which has been bad, right? And to recover you to the point as though it never happened. That's shalom. Come on. Somebody needs God to shalom them with some shalom and shalom them with some shalom tonight. See, this brother on the, on the front row, that's, some of you know him. It's Lyndall Cooley, a uh, great, great man of God, friend of ours. But you know, I found out a while back that Lyndall uh, was washing his car and it had a heart attack and they took him to the hospital. And what was it called? A, uh, what was it? An aortic dissection that most people don't live through. Are there any doctors or nurses here that knows what that is, an aortic dissection? You don't normally live through. That's what's the percentage of people who actually live and survive? 15%. And then they did a surgery and had to go back in and do another one. He had a horrible hernia. Doctor said, we can't do nothing with the hernia. I saw this man. I was at his house. We went to see him and I saw him sitting there and he would just break out in a sweat and he had such pain. He could hardly move. He could hardly walk. But I knew there was a verse in the Bible that says, I shall restore to you the years. <laughs> Lyndall, stand up. Can you walk around, Lyndall? I want you to give, I want you to walk around. That's a man that's supposed to be dead, but is in the house of God tonight, enjoying the glory of God. Because he believed that the God of heaven can take the years of what the devil's tried to do to kill you, turn it around, and make a blessing out of... I need somebody to shout with me. I need somebody to rejoice in the Lord your God. Samson was restored. David was restored. Peter was restored. Just, just, just remain where you are for just a moment. Let me say this to you. And in Psalms, one of my favorite verses. In fact, I, there's a friend of mine. I've known her for years. I knew her before she ever got called to preach. I was the first preacher she ever heard at camp meeting named Paula White. And I talked to Paula one day. I said, Paula, uh, I've got a title for a book. And if you don't write it, I will. And if, and if I don't write it, I'm going to give it to Jensen because he could preach it. And you may preach, it's just a title, it's just a title. But David says to God, when he went through hell and he lost about it, his friends and he knew he did wrong and a woman gets pregnant and, and the baby dies and he has the husband. He didn't personally kill the guy, but he was responsible for it. As bad, a man of God after God's going to hold far as low as they can go. And he, he could have said a lot of things to God. He could have said, let me have a press conference and get me a press man that can kind of, kind of cover this for me. And he could have got his people in Jerusalem together and said, I want you to fire the people against me, take them out in the woods and hang them. They did that in the old days. He could have, he could have said, I didn't do it. She's lying. It ain't my baby. There wasn't any day in DNA testing back then. He could have lied about it, but you, are you listening? No, he could have lied about it. 
He could say, she went, everybody knows what my palace looks like. Man, what do you do? I don't know who this one, he could have lied about it. But when he got confronted face to face and Nathan said, you're the man, he said, I am the man. But let me tell you what he missed the most. It wasn't about power. It wasn't even about his influence because he lost some of that. But here's what he said. God, please restore to me the joy of my salvation. God put a right spirit in me. Now, are you ready for this? Here's what he said. That the bones that you have broken may rejoice. And that word in Hebrew is dance again. And my message was called dancing on broken bones. Did he listen? Did he ever get it back? Yeah, people were, people were there to remind him. People were there to jab him. But he gets down there. He says, last thing he says in 150, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him on the organ. Praise him with a tambourine. Praise him with the cymbals. And then he says, praise him with the dance. You better hear me. You might live the rest of your life feeling like you got a limp like Jacob. And you got to walk around because an angel had to hit you in the leg because you were in the wrong direction. And you might live some of your life feeling like you got broken bones. But you better hear this preacher. God is a God of restoration. The whole Bible is a book of restoration. And if you don't believe in restoration, you might as well get up and walk out of here because you do not know what the Word says. I've come by to tell somebody that God will let you dance again on some broken bones and the bone might feel might have been broke but you're not going to feel the pain you're not going to feel what it was like well hallelujah to the son of the most high god who has redeemed us Be seated. I want to. I want to give the altar call. I, I had a story, but the Lord says it's time. Please just reverence the Lord. Would you just, li- even if you, even if you feel like you're not saved or away from God, honor your Father in heaven by lifting your hand of surrender to Him. Would you, Whew. Lord Jesus? Somebody watching needs this. People in this room need this. And Lord. I want you to keep your hand up. I get a word. I'm getting a word of knowledge. And it's for someone here. There's several people in this room that. You've had things happen in your life. That you haven't really told anybody about. And and you shouldn't. You should let it go and be under the blood. But you. Have never been able. Since you went through what this has been through. You've never been able to feel like that you had that, that real deep connection with your father that you had, maybe when you were younger, maybe before this happened, and you sit in church, and the whole time everybody's worshiping, you hear a voice reminding you of failure. And I want to, you to understand something, ladies and gentlemen. The whole Bible is a book of restoration. It is a book of redemption. And I'm going to do what I do every night. We, we just give simple altar calls. I don't know anything else to do. I'm not into hype. I'm not into sensationalism. But I've preached a message on a wounded soul. And I know everybody here could say, well, I've had a wound. And some of you had it and got over it. But there are some of you here tonight on this Wednesday night that honestly, you, you just haven't, you're stuck. You can't seem to get beyond the past. You can't seem to get beyond what happened to you. You can't seem to get beyond that. You, you've been hurt. You, you, you've experienced church hurt. You've experienced wound in churches. You left churches to go to other places. And you still see these people. And it hurts. It stings. You only know you're healed when you can see a person and the pain's gone. And you can do that. It may take a little time. But I'm going to tell you, it's, it takes the Holy Spirit On the count of three, even if you have left church because of a wound, you especially, 
I'd love to see you down here, but there's, there's people that have been in church and they say, Perry, I, I'm at a ceiling. Even with my worship and my praise, I know I, I haven't broke through because there's something in my soul that's, that's been stabbed and cut. They took the life out of me, man. I feel like the life has gone out of me. There's a woman here. Now, there may, somebody said, well, there's many women here that this could be. But I'm going to tell this. You, this woman will know who she is. There's a woman here. And I'm going to be very, I'm going to be so, I'm going to be by the Holy Ghost so plain about this. You're not going to be able to doubt me that it's, that it's you, that, that it's you. You were married. And in the days you were married, you were much thinner. You even had a little bit longer hair than you've got now. And your husband always bragged on you're the most beautiful woman. And as time passed, I see a child involved, a birth, births involved. You put on a lot of weight and your husband bugged you so much about you're putting on weight, you're putting on weight, you're putting on weight. And he went and found him another girlfriend. And he's, he's, he's walked out. And there's not a day that goes by. I'm telling you by the spirit of God, sister, there's not a day goes by that you don't look in the mirror and hate how you look. There's not a day that goes by that you don't look and say, well, maybe I should have done something. Yeah, what he said is probably true. He called you sloppy. He just said all kinds of things to you. He thought he was trying to motivate you to do something. And it was, it's just hard. it was hard on you. You were the kind of person that was, this was difficult on you. I don't know who you are, but when everybody comes forward, when everybody comes forward, all you got to do is slip in the crowd. Nobody's going to know but you and the Lord. But the Lord said he wants to heal you of an emotion where you feel ashamed of yourself. God, listen. God's not ashamed of you. You're ashamed of yourself because of what somebody put on you. And I want to tell you, you are not what people say about you. Never are you what people say. If it's a negative word, that's not what God's saying over you. Oh, boy, I feel the Holy Ghost so strong. I want the wounded people to get down here on the count of three. Fill this place up. Kneel down if you can. Do we have an altar team, correct, Pastor? Can we get the altar team kind of to come in the front and line up four, five, ten, how many there are? Come quick. I need you real fast. Just line up. We're going to do this a little different because I want you to be here when the people get here. Thank you. On the count of three, I want wounded people to come down here. And that's it. Just kind of spread out all the way down. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Yes, look at these precious people. Okay, there's a team here. They will agree. But, but if you can kneel down, I just love to see you come. If you can, if you physically can't, that's fine. But I love to see people kneel down because it's just that it's humility before God. On the count of three, I want the wounded people down here. And whoever that sister was, you come. One, two, three. Come right now in Jesus' name. God wants to heal you. I'm telling you, God wants to heal you tonight. Yeah, um, now, now there's, a, there's a large group coming. Come all the way to the front, if you can, all the way. All the way. When this fills up, when this fills up over on, on my left, which is your right, let them, let the people, let the prayer team pray for them along the side. That's fine. And also this side prayer team, move among the people that are on this side. Okay. If you will, because we have so many people, we just can't get to them. The rest of you, if you could, if you, you want to remain seated for just a moment while these are coming to the Lord. I want you to talk to your father in heaven like you're sitting across the table from him and you tell him your heart and you tell him I've been wounded God and I want to be healed and the spirit of God is going to come on you and some of you are going to start weeping don't stop that let it let the tears come those are healing tears Whew. everybody seated would you lift up your voice and start praying for him for the next eight or nine minutes please Oh, oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
Jesus. Jesus. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. In the name of the healer. Jesus is the wounded healer. He's already carried wounds. Lord, give him a revelation that they don't have to carry what you carried. Show them how to release this. Oh, my, my. Everybody, everybody in the building, ignore me. I'm going to talk to the people watching. Those of you watching right now, as we're praying all over this sanctuary. There's people sitting right now watching me that have dropped out of a church because of what happened. But it's only hurt you. It hasn't hurt anybody else. It's hurt you. The Lord says to forgive the people that you are offended with and get back in his presence. You're missing the presence of God. You're missing the end time revival. You're missing what God's doing. For what? Everybody pray out loud. Come on, lift your voice. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name asking you for every one of the people that are here for there to be a supernatural healing. I call supernatural healing into your spirit. Ma'am, sir, I call supernatural, young person, I call supernatural healing that can only come from the Holy Spirit into your spirit. I say to you that as you pour out your heart to God, as you open up to him, you take the walls down, you take the barriers down. You've had barriers and walls up because you don't want to get hurt again. You don't want to be disappointed again. You don't want something to happen that causes you a setback. But I speak to you in the name of Jesus that God, the Father in heaven, brings his healing power into your life right now. That you will be healed. You will be completely, totally made whole in your mind and in your spirit. Everybody pray on the Holy Ghost in the building. If you are filled with the Holy Ghost, pray in the Spirit. Somebody needs a yoke broke tonight. Come on, we need to pray them through. Break it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Break through, Father, in Jesus' name. As they pray and as they seek your face and as they call upon your name, let salvation, deliverance, healing, restoration. I call restoration into you. I call restoration into your mind. I call restoration into your soul. I call restoration into your spirit that God Almighty will perform his work in your life. Oh, Jesus, front to the back. God, from the front to the back, move, move, move. Oh, oh move, move, Holy Spirit, move. Oh, Move, God, into their heart. Take out the stony heart. Take out the calloused heart. Take out what has made them feel hard against you, Lord. Oh, bring healing in the name of Jesus. Bring emotional healing in the name of Jesus. Help them to forget those things that are behind. But reach out to the forefront. Reach out to what's ahead of them. We rebuke the lies of the enemy. We rebuke the lies of Satan or his imps. We rebuke the lies of people that have said things, Heavenly Father, that are not true. We ask you, God, to bring healing in the name of Jesus. Bring healing in the name of Jesus. Everybody that's prayed for it, lift up your voice twice as loud and cry out to God. The Lord wants to hear you pray. Just cry out to the Lord right now. Hallelujah. Come on, Jesus. Do your work, Jesus. Do your work with these people, Lord. Do your work with these people, Lord. These men and women, oh, God. Remember, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Keep praying in the aisles and the altar. Everybody else stand and let's worship the Lord while we're praying. Don't quit praying. Don't quit praying, please. Stay in His presence. In the name of Jesus. It's been a you knew where I lived. 
Spirit of God to say this to you, that those of you that in this meeting so far have felt like you were cold, a little indifferent, lukewarm, need to be baptized in water again. When I was going through a real rough time in my life, I went to Ramp Hamilton and my daughter said, Dad, you know, why don't you just get baptized again? I said, I'm the preacher. She says, you just need to get baptized again and ask God to take all that those feelings you have, you know, you're kind of bitter towards some people and stuff. You, get, you need deliverance. Boy, when, you, when your daughter tells the preacher you need deliverance, you better pay attention. And I got in that muddy Williams Creek. And I had been baptized in probably 300 young people. And I said, all right, I'm next. This really happened. I went under that water. And I know it's water. Came up, and it's like everything that was on me washed down the creek. It really happened. I was totally... I was totally, where's Pam? Pam will verify this. I was totally free. I was so free it scared me because I hadn't felt like that. And I'm talking about mentally, emotionally, you know. So I want you to consider, uh, they'll, announce, they'll announce this time and they'll announce when we're gonna, they're gonna do this. But uh, <laughs> I have a friend of mine that takes a, takes a cow trough and he just puts it out somewhere in the church and they just baptize them while church is going on. I'm not, Jensen, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, Pastor, okay? So just, you're Pastor, I'm not suggesting that. But where, where are you at, Pastor Franklin? I feel like the, I want you to come up here. 
Where's he? Oh, he's over there. I don't want to disturb him. Is he praying? Oh, come on, Pastor, if you can. Listen now. I want to say something to you, and then I'm going to give it to Pastor. I've been preaching 47 years, going on 47 years. I've had revivals go 11 weeks every night, five weeks every night, seven and a half weeks every night. And as long as the revival was going on, it was completely full. But I do know this. You don't run a revival just to do it. And Pastor and I is not going to do that. We do this because we see this right here. This is what this is about. It's not, it's not about my preaching, what I'm going to say, what I'm going to preach, because you don't even know what I'm preaching. You're here because you're hearing God is moving. You want to bring your family. You want to bring your friends. You want to bring your dad. You want to bring your mom. We, let me tell you something. I, I, say this, I say this sincerely. We're the closest to an actual nuclear war than we've ever been. And I know things you don't know, and I'm not trying to scare you, but I want to tell you something. Jesus will come. One of these days, we're going to get out of bed, and that's our last day on earth together. And that's why this meeting, I believe this, Pastor, I believe that's why God wants this meeting to get these people back in God's house and back on fire for God. And even if you don't go to church here, let me say, if you don't go to church here, we invite you, though, to, to take us to your church and to bring the fire there and bring people from there who need to be filled. We have, we've not even had the service yet. We, we pray for the Holy Ghost, and that's always one of the greatest services of the meeting. We're trying to be led of the Lord. Now, the next two services, I want you to just believe me when I tell you, I have been waiting to preach what I'm going to tell you tomorrow night. This will set you free. And I want you to be here on Friday night. And as Pastor said, the Lord willing, we're going to take Saturday off, but we'll just judge things. But we'll be back Sunday, and we don't have a plan. He, he'll tell you, we don't have an agenda. We're just trying to say, God, if God says we're done, we're done, okay? But if God says we're not, he knows. We just do whatever God says. So I want you to be here tomorrow night and Friday. And look, I want to see I, how, many, how many high schools are in Gainesville. Raise your hand. How many, are in, how many high schools? There's eight? Okay, I want all you kids in high school to bring the football team. I know they got to play this week. Now, I'm serious. I, I saw a vision, and I don't know if it's here, but I saw a vision years ago of a whole football team running to the altar. And let it be here. No, let it be here. And then the cheerleaders come, and then the other, you know. So I want you all to get the whole football team. I want you to get the cheerleaders here. I want you to get every, just get everybody you can. You said, we well, can't get it. Yes, yes, yes. There's people that can come some nights, can't come the other night. There will always be a place for you. So come and be a part.